Hey there, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. So before we get into today's episode, I have a question for you. What would it be like if you could take a cocktail every morning that could dramatically reduce your risk of heart disease, obesity, diabetes, neurological disease, cancer, and simultaneously boost your mood, your resilience, and your energy levels? Well, For the last two years, I have, with the help of many of my friends, colleagues, experts in nutrition and nutritional supplements, been formulating four absolutely cutting edge, breakthrough, incredibly powerful supplements uh, for four main things. And those things are, one, Energenesis is the most powerful mitochondrial enhancing supplement on the market for long-term energy production. Ultra Brain is the most powerful natural nootropic supplement for brain performance, cognitive performance, as well as mood optimization and long-term brain health simultaneously. We've got Immune Genesis, our latest supplement, which is all about, of course, supercharging immune function, which everybody wants to do right now. And we've got Energy Essentials and Superfoods, which is a comprehensive ultra premium multivitamin and multimineral with all of the best forms of those vitamins and minerals, uh, not the cheapy stuff that you find in common multivitamin and mineral supplements. And it's got a ton of amazing superfoods with proven metabolic benefits, things like uh, spirulina, chlorella, pomegranate, and many, many others. So these are within their respective four categories, bar none, the best supplements in those categories. Uh, And if you compare the dosages and the ingredients used to any other supplements within those categories, you will absolutely see that for yourself. And I encourage you to do that. So anyway, this is to let you know about those four supplements. If you don't already know about them, head over to store.theenergyblueprint.com and go check out the ingredients. We've put together pages with all of the ingredients, with all of the research on all of those ingredients. Uh, these are not just typical you know, sales pages with a lot of hype and claims. Uh, we're just showing you the actual research behind all of these ingredients that are in these formulations. They are incredibly powerful. We get incredible testimonials virtually every day from people using these supplements. Uh, And for many people, they're absolutely life-changing. So go check them out, get on these supplements. Like I said, this is uh, a cocktail that you can use. And and there's proven science to show that this cocktail can dramatically reduce your risk of numerous diseases while simultaneously boosting your mood and energy levels in a hugely powerful way. So go check it out, store.theenergyblueprint.com. Hey there, this is Ari. Welcome back to the Energy Blueprint Podcast. I am very excited about today's guest. It's someone who I've been in communication with for many years now, and she is someone that was um, very influential indirectly on my parenting and the way I brought up my kids by sharing a very important book with me, this book called The Continuum Concept by Jean Leadloff. And we are going to be talking all about that today because... My guest, Gerilyn Gendro, just wrote a new book called Jungle Gene that's going to be coming out soon. And it's all about chronicling this, this woman's life, Jean Leadloff, and the, the seminal work that she did in understanding um, what I consider to be optimal parenting of human children. So very excited about this. I'm going to read you Gerilyn's bio, and then we're going to jump in. So she is a licensed psychotherapist since 1995. She's playful, somewhat irreverent life coach who believes it, who believes that one of the keys to happiness is being able to laugh at yourself. Gerilyn's approach to psychotherapy is grounded in the theories and insights of her mentor, Jean Leadloff, and who is the author of The Continuum Concept. That's the book I just showed you. Her greatest passion is spreading the word on the naturally good-humored child-rearing approach of our tribal ancestors. In her counseling work, she practices knowledge therapy, assisting those who did not have a fully enriched infancy and childhood 
under, to understand the impact of missing experiences and gain the insight, self-knowledge, and courage to live a fully actualized life. And by the way, her favorite brain hack is jumping out of an airplane. So welcome, Gerilyn. It's such a pleasure to connect with you in real time. Yeah, it's great to see you, Ari. I was in one of your first blueprints, I think the second one. That mm -hmm. was what, 2017? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, and it, you blew my mind. There's still, you, your influence on my life was probably stronger than any other teacher since my sixth grade English teacher, Mrs. Tennyson. Oh, wow. well, there was also my philosophy professor in, in college. So uh, thank you for your work, for what you do. I, I have RE artifacts all over my house. I still drink water first thing in the morning, you know, from your very first free video about <laughs> hormesis, right? Hormesis. It was probably something related to no, autophagy. No. Autophagy. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. autophagy and hormesis. I've never forgotten those things. I do interval cycling. You know, I have my uh, solo sauna out in the garage. It's like, this is a sunlight and sauna. And uh, you, the one that turned me on to that. It's like my battery. I consider it my battery recharger. You know, I go in there. It's a little igloo. It's so fun. Anyway, I just really admire and love you and appreciate the work you do in the world, like big time. And watching you, so you raise much. your kids, watching you raise your kids is just on Facebook. It just makes me giddy. Hmm. Thank you so much, my friend. I really appreciate that. And the feeling is so mutual now that I'm reading your work. So um, let's first talk about how you got into this. Why, why Gene Leadloff? Why the continuum concept? What got you started in this world? Uh, I think it has to track back to my hunger for what she discovered and articulated as our natural state, that human nature was designed to be cooperative and happy. And we got derailed somewhere along the line. And my interest in that state, it actually tracks back to a near-death experience I had in 1987. I was 29. My father had died the year before. It's a long story, but essentially I went on a vision quest. I was at Point Reyes National Seashore, Kellam Beach, and running around. I was training for my black belt in Taekwondo and you know, enjoying the sunshine, getting really hot and sweaty, and then before we were hiking five miles back to my car, I decided to run into the waves. I grew up in Southern California, like going and diving to the waves is just natural, you know, sprint, dive, cool off, come out. Well, Northern California coast is very different than Southern California. Down here, we have the Santa Barbara Islands down there. It just drops off the waves, pound the shore. I went head first into a wave, crushed C3, fractured C2 and C4, went into a near death experience. At the end of that, that's a whole long story. It was 20 minutes and I remember every minute of it in slow motion, you know, from encountering God to my whole life, kind of doing a back bend and me feeling the impact I had on people throughout my life, that was profound and humbling. But at the end of it, when I was laying on the beach, I was paralyzed for a while. And then my friend helped me start crawling and I crawled up, that's a long story too, but I won't go into it. So we only have an hour, but, um, at the end of it, when I was the, when the feeling was returning to my body, like I think my spinal cord wasn't broken; it just had a severe shock. So as as it refound its networks, which who knows why it did that, I um, experienced being surrounded by love, just held like the whole universe was pulsing, breathing, liquid love, and it was like the I called it for a long time. I taught yoga for a long time, and I called it ocean of love yoga because that's what. I knew is what we are at our core and it's what I didn't experience. It was, it was the missing experience. If you wanna talk about the big missing experience, it's about being born into a universe that is nothing but love. Mm -hmm. Like how many people can do that? So that set me on And when I was laying there and I wasn't paralyzed and I was breathing and I was certain that I was alive and I felt this from everywhere, I, I was like, suddenly it occurred to me and I asked the question, why haven't I ever felt like this before? Mm. Like, this is what I truly am. Why have I, and so that set me on the quest that eventually led me to Jean. I went to graduate school shortly after that, went back to bartending and did graduate school at the same time and got my marriage and family therapy degree, the master's degree in counseling psych. And I, at the end of that, I was like, okay, this was 91. So it was like the 
the uh, positive psychology movement hadn't really caught on yet. And so I spent three years studying neurosis and psychosis and I could name it all and you know recognize the symptoms, but I didn't know much about healthy, happy people. And I, I thought, okay, so I got the ABCs of human messed upness. Where are the healthy people and how'd they get that way? And you know, I there was a couple other hops, Rianne Eisler, and somebody handed me that book, Continuum Concept. I thought I read Rianne Eisler's book, The Chalice and the Blade, which is all about early matriarchal cultures and how they and I I'd been working in a drug and alcohol treatment facility in San Francisco in the mission. And there was a parenting manual, and I couldn't follow this parenting manual. I was like, what do you mean she can't carry her child around? He's a crack baby. He's a mess. His nervous system needs to be calmed down. What do you mean? She can't even lay down and take a nap with him. That doesn't make any sense to me. So my body like rejected this. I'm not a mom, haven't had kids, but I have a maternal instinct and it was hopping mad. I was like not happening, but I couldn't, you know, I would have lost my job. So I quit. And uh, it was about that time that uh, I read Rihanna Lizer's book and I was like, okay, what would the parenting manual look like back then? And jokingly, I said to a friend, I need to find a time machine. And she said, oh, no, you don't. Just read this. And she handed me the continuum concept. Oh, wow. So that's how I got to see Gene and then spent 15 years of my life in a really interesting relationship with her. Yeah, Beautiful. she was an interest, she was an interesting woman. Okay, so now let's jump to continuum concept. What is that? What is, oh, okay. <laughs> what is this book all about? Like for, uh, let's assume most of the listeners have never heard of this and have no idea okay. what Jean's work. Yeah, so Jean, uh, she was an upper west side Manhattan socialite. Her grandmother died and she left for Europe. She did the European tour and met this Italian, blonde haired, blue eyed Italian count at the party of the century on the Grand Canal in Venice. So he, she, he, she'd heard of him and it was rumored that he'd been to the jungles of South America on a diamond hunting expedition and was, and she didn't know he was about to make another one, but she found out, she convinced him to take her along. But that was her first trip deep into the rainforests of Venezuela. And back then nobody had heard the term rainforest, it was the jungle, you know, it was 1951. So she then made uh, one more expedition with the Italians and then three that she led herself. And at the end of all that, she was back in New York and uh, hanging out with George Plimpton and you know Jack Kerouac and all those people. And eventually she wrote this book. She, was, she had to process what she'd seen. She wasn't an anthropologist. She didn't go to study them. She went there and lived with them. She lived among them and she had a genius mind. She was a very original thinker. She felt that not having gone to university is why she was able to see. She was like, when she got kicked out of Cornell or something, she said that was the end of the interference. <laughs> so that she could have an open mind and, and see what she saw and draw conclusions from witnessing rather than going in with a conclusion you're trying to prove. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's the, the continuum concept is a theory that derived from her experiences there. So she would call them Stone Age Indians. That's not an appropriate term these days, but she said that she, she was like, I returned to the Stone Age. This was the Stone Age. And she saw a, a tribe of humans that raised their children, that reared, she'd hate that I said raise, you raise cattle, you rear children, that they, they they're, they're continuum is intact. So they're being raised the way mammal, human, homo sapiens were raised over 7 million years of hominid evolution. They were held. Here's the way I make the idea as clear as possible. A human infant, unlike let's say a horse, is born basically prematurely. There, there are heads got big and pushing a baby out, I hear, I understand, is quite an ordeal. So with this big headed thing, and the head got big, the, the problem is we went upright, the pelvis shrinks. There's not as much room down there. So it was the babies that were born prematurely that survived. So evolution determined that we would become upright and, and 
therefore born very prematurely. So the human infant needs more, like a colt comes out and within five minutes he's on his legs. And you know, that afternoon he's finding food and romping around. We need to be held close to the body. So this is, this is my metaphor. So it's not even a metaphor. So think about a marsupial. They're upright, but they're still squat. So they have this pouch to put the baby in. So the baby's where it belongs. It's not inside mommy's body, but it's outside mommy's body and it knows it's safe. It knows the universe is, it knows it's wanted. It feels welcome. It doesn't stress out because it's always looking for the contact that it's evolution, it's continuum tells the baby it needs. So it's the, so that's the continuum. It's the biological evolutionary continuum of innate expectations. So a human infant is born expecting this holding, expecting this closeness to mother's body. That's what allows its brain development to be optimal. All those synapses and neural networks are forming around either being accepted and loved or being left alone in a crib. You get a different animal altogether. If you give the infant what it's evolution, you can't argue with evolution, sorry, or you can. I think it's uh, Byron Katie who says, you can't argue with reality. You can argue with reality, but you'll be wrong, but only 100% time. And it's like that about evolution. Like you can argue with it, but evolution is gonna win because it's a power that your mind, your, your intellect can't possibly, you know, go up against with any success anyway so that's the long answer to your question yeah you know th this appeals to me so much because i've been studying natural health for pretty much my whole life since i was a little kid it's been my mm -hmm. singular obsession yeah <laughs> um one of the big things that i preach and and, and something that um there's some people who share some some definitely so there's a there's quite a number of people who share some overlap of philosophy that I do but mm -hmm. not many that are I think as hardcore about it and as deep about it as as I tend to be yeah. and that is really just understanding and committing to this understanding that human health is really just about aligning yourself aligning your actions your lifestyle your environmental and lifestyle inputs with what your biology needs as a result of evolution. And this, this book, this concept, the continuum concept and, and Jean's philosophy of, of parenting that she's developed as a result of observing these tribes is essentially the parenting equivalent of my health philosophy, you know, and, and one, one thing I read, um, recently as I was, I was diving into this was, you know, the definition of the continuum concept as the idea that in order to achieve optimal physical, mental, and emotional development, human beings, especially babies, require the kind of experience to which our species adapted during the long process of, of our evolution. And that it's it's a simple concept, but if you think about it, and if you think about the you know my my realm of expertise, which is the health side of things, and you just examine, okay, what what exactly are the environmental li and lifestyle inputs that humans need, that human biology needs to thrive and function optimally, mm -hmm. and you consider that the modern environment and lifestyle is almost perfectly at odds. <laughs> what we need. I mean, we, we're getting almost everything wrong from yes. <laughs> like artificial light blaring into our eyes at night, disrupting circadian rhythm, which disrupts, you know, all kinds <laughs> of neurotransmitters and hormones and mitochondrial function to, um, to, you know, staying up late to chronic psychological stress, to all these toxins in the environment, to being physically inactive, to eating processed junk food instead of, you know, whole unprocessed foods on and on and on um, to being, you know, se secured in indoor climate controlled environments instead of exposed to the elements, to have to move and, and hunt and gather our foods, um, to, to have to endure those physical stresses and to have to also endure periods of food scarcity or, you know, food abundance. All of those things were built into our ancient lifestyle and we're lacking all of those fundamental inputs that our biology actually requires as a result of millions of years of evolution it requires those inputs for 
not just optimal health, but for normal health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this philosophy seems basically just to be the parenting equivalent of everything I just explained. And it's, and it's basically saying, hey, we, the way modern parents parent their kids and, and our culture and our teachings around that, we've gotten things wrong. And we, we, we are disconnected from what our evolutionary needs are. Yeah. Um, so do you do you agree with what I just explained there? Totally, and totally. It's, it's like I'm I'm vibrating with all of it. So so there's a uh, so I want to say one thing about Jean's work because it does apply to all of this. She became she had no intention of becoming a baby care expert. She used to say it's just that that's what caught on. Her book is really about human nature, mm. and it's really about our relationship with the natural world. So this is not this. A lot of people are talking about this. Jean just happens to have had a voice that rang into the ears of parents around the world. The book's been translated into 21 languages. And and so the message got out. Now, the interesting thing is people don't really need to know what the continuum concept is. Some of them get totally into it, but it still impacts their parenting. So Jean's book, The Continuum Concept, and her as a personality, in a sense, she wasn't like a public figure like these days, and there was no internet, but she was known and loved around the world. So I've lost my train of thought. What was the question? Oh, do I agree with that? Mm -hmm. So there is definitely, um, I, I mean, it's it's the same thing, really, what you're saying, and that you're that you're building it onto the, you know, the this is the social app. app dimension of it what Jean's talking about and you're very in the biological di dimension of it, which feeds the psychology you know impacts your psychology which then impacts the sociology of the whole thing so it's just this I mean we are such complex creatures and we have gotten it so wrong it's like you couldn't be more on the opposite ends of the spectrum mm -hmm. what we evolved the optimal conditions under which we evolved and the conditions under which we're raising children now we're living now, we're warring and loving and destroying and killing and being unjust and being full of love and kindness. There's that everywhere too. I think there's a balance actually. I think it's definitely like love, kindness and compassion. It just doesn't get the headlines, mm -hmm. you know? I think there is as much good in human nature, more good in human nature than bad. The bad has just had the megaphone for whatever Two thousand years or whatever, but our innate nature is joy and love. There's so many stories in in the book about the, how these people. One thing I want to say, you, uh, we talked briefly about sleep. My sleep has profoundly changed since I did the energy blueprint system. I mean, profoundly. Uh, I'm so grateful for that. I was I'm postmenopausal, and most of my friends are lucky to get five hours. I consistently get seven. Nice. You know, it's really, really good. And, you know, the blue lights everywhere. I can't, like, what is the conspiracy against the circadian rhythms? I walk in the kitchen <laughs> at night. I actually drape the, because the oven has a thing, the, the, this has a thing. There's like four or five blue lights if I walk into the kitchen late at night. Yes. So I put the, I, I throw the dish towels over them. You know, like I cover them up. If I walk through the living room and there's a, there's a blue thing on the, on the TV, I put the pillow in front of it. Because, you know, sometimes if I can't sleep, I get up and walk and do deep breathing and, you know, get out of my mind. But if you do that without covering those things, it's just going to wake you up. But most people don't know that. So you turned me on to all that stuff. I have so much data in my head that was installed by Ari Witten. <laughs> but then I diverge. <laughs> so so let's, let's, and actually real quick, I want to mention uh, in my last house, I used to throw dish towels over our dishwasher every night to the, the light on it. So I know the feeling. I haven't heard of anybody else doing that until you just. Oh met. man, I think everybody, I think they should invent a duct tape that will eliminate those lights. And that would, that now there's a product. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually someone has created that, believe it or not. There's little, oh, good. little black dots. Yeah, kind of yeah. Put, over, put over little light sources like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so let's get specific about what it is. What are the fundamental distinctions between how we are currently rearing children and what what Gene identified as optimal? And I, if if I, I want to read this little quote, that's one of my favorite quotes from her. Yeah. She said, yeah. "A culture which requires people to live." in a way for which their evolution has not prepared them 
which does not fulfill their innate expectations and therefore pushes their adaptability beyond its limits is bound to damage their personalities. So, and, and we could say literally the exact same thing for health more broadly. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, a, a culture and a lifestyle that, that um, has different norms than what the biology expects um, pushes their, their body, their cells beyond its adaptability. And therefore, instead of damage to their personalities, you get damage to cellular function and to the, the system-wide biological function. Um, that results in fatigue and disease in general. So this is really, as you said, just the, the, the psychological and sociological dimension of the same concept. But what specifically are these mismatches between um, what our biology is expecting based on our evolutionary past and how that is mismatched between um, our modern lifestyle and, and child rearing methods? Well, so let's let's take what you're talking about with the biology and just think about digestion and the immune system. So when when a human baby is in its right place, it comes out of the womb, it goes on mom's belly, it pretty much doesn't lose contact with mother or some other warm body until maybe it's 18 or it crawls off on its own. But think about those first moments, the, the baby in its right place, immediately first food is mother's colostrum. Okay, this lays down the foundation for a healthy immune system. We have an ap epidemic of autoimmune diseases. You think maybe there's a connection? I have three, or I've had three, you know, if you count the eczema that comes, you know, very rarely, four. So why, you know, I was, so when I was born in 1957, I just aged myself, uh, they thought sodium pentothal was a good labor drug. Mm -hmm. That's truth serum. It's a fast acting anesthetic. They use it in euthanasia and they put, they put my mom, that in my mom. And you know, it went into my bloodstream. I came out, couldn't keep food down. I kept vomiting and probably because they were feeding me formula or whatever hospital food there was because there was a taboo on breastfeeding at that point. So from the gate, I missed essential experiences. This is what we call missing experiences. My, everything in my body, just like my lungs were prepared to breathe air, and my skin was prepared to respond to temperature changes. And my eyes were evolved to see a certain spectrum of light and not like what a wolf sees or a dog even, but what a human needs to survive. So if there's disruptions at that age, they, there are developmental stages. So when a baby is born and the mother has just been through this ordeal and she has surrendered and had to love and become bigger than she's ever been before, because who goes through that kind of pain? So she's had to go out of her mind to be, you know, access the, the like maternal, whatever it is, the magic of women that they can give birth and not kill, you know, like not whatever, whatever, their, their body's getting ripped open. They have to forget who they are. I mean, I haven't had a baby, but that's my assumption. Um, <clears throat> and right after that, they see this little thing and there's a flood of hormones and the mother-child bond fo fo forms right there. And it's like a magnet, you know, when you put your plug in your Mac and it goes, and it like makes this cute little noise. Like that's like the mother infant bond. And it needs to, it needs to happen right then and there. Now, if it happens, you know, an hour later, then it'll be, it won't be as strong or it'll have some faults in it, you know, but what if the baby is taken away and, you know, mom and dad go home and the baby doesn't get to go home. So there's a whole sequence of events that don't occur. Mm -hmm. And it's not unlike, you know, it's in the first trimester that the arm bud pops out. If, if, if it doesn't happen in the first trimester, it's not gonna happen in the second trimester because all of this is exquisitely timed. How, how we grow in utero. And also our development once we come out is exquisitely timed. And both mother and infant have this, they know the signals. They have this sophisticated set of signals. Little ones have these very sophisticated signals to say what, that I need something, I need something. And of course, mom has the same receptors to those signals. So the child never goes without it needs. And mom isn't a slave to the child either because they just do it in the flow of life. Baby, baby care, baby child rearing is not a separate thing for them. Mm -hmm. So even the fact that we objectify child rearing and objectify children, 
the fact that there's been these missing experiences, like the mother bond didn't form the way evolution informed the, the child and the growing brain and eventually the psychology it should have been. So, so the, that what could be the cornerstone has like, it's kind of like laid like this, it's a little wobbly. And so throughout the life, you have a psychology that develops a mistaken impression of the self. Like I can't get what I need here. Like I, I can't get what I need. I cannot get what I need. So a personality founded on, I can't get what I need and it's not safe here is a very different personality from one that grows up like, I'm right where I belong and it's all seamless and these people around me are laughing all the time and I never go hungry and I'm next to this and I can hear the heartbeat. So my heartbeat knows what a homo sapien heartbeat is supposed to be like. And they're jostled around all the time. They, you know, the, they, the mothers dance with the baby, its head doesn't fall off. And, and the baby, so the baby discharges, the baby's energy gets discharged. That's one of the points that Jean made that I think was so beautiful. Like, you know how moms tend to bounce their baby? You know, especially they bounce them and burp them. Well, babies can't discharge their own energy. They have, a, and we all have an energy field and a baby is evolved to expect that that energy is going to get, get discharged by mom's body. You know, their batteries, their positive, whatever, that the energy exchange of mom's body keeps the baby's energy moving. So we put a baby in a crib or in the, the stroller and it sits there and maybe it's bouncing in a stroller, but it's laying there and it's got all this energy and it's trying to get the energy out, you know, and it'll do whatever it needs to do, ride, kick, you know, whine, scream, because it's got more energy than it's supposed to have. Its system is not designed to discharge its own energy because it didn't have to for 7 million years of evolution and evolution doesn't like duplication, doesn't need that duplication. So, the, so that's part of why the signals are there. It's like, right, I need this. Okay, good. It's it's kind of like contact improv. You know, if you've ever watched contact improv, really skilled contact dancers, it's amazing. They their bodies merge. So mom might be, you know, you know, weaving or smashing or whatever, and the baby's just jostled around all the time. And that's part of how it learns. You know, it's absorbing all the time. This is what my people do. And they did have a lot of laughter. The Aquana tribe, it was like the fun and laughter. That's something I've been feeling into. I remember in uh, the energy blueprint system, you talked, there was a, there was a module about play. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing that then going, geez, I don't play. <laughs> like, what's wrong with me? I don't play. I can't, I, I used to play Frisbee on the beach. That was fun play, you know, but got out of the habit of that. And martial arts wasn't exactly pray, you know, play, but kind of, it could get playful. I went to ecstatic dance for years because everybody, people would get into their like, you know, it was so much fun. It was, that was the best play, adult play I've ever had, but we haven't had that with COVID for a long time. Yeah, I, actually, I actually just went to a party like that yesterday. Uh, well, you're in, you're down in Costa Rica where things are a little lighter. We're down in Costa Rica uh, where, yeah, there's, there's much, there's about one one hundredth of that level of kind of fear and hysteria around it so yeah it's basically normal and yeah. people function normally and people hug and have dance parties and um so I was there with with my two kids having you know basically dancing till their bedtime and swinging them around on the dance floor and handing them off to friends and you know they, they so I think that's probably um as close to you can as, as you can get to the kind of parenting that that uh the continuum concept strives for. Yeah, you're you're you have a tribe around you. That's you know the nuclear family was a bad idea, about as bad as the nuclear bomb, maybe worse. So it's just not a good idea. That's another place why we where we diverged from evolution so strongly that th that creates all kinds of stressors. You know, a single parent raising a child that's insane. Allo parenting is how we evolve. That's you know like group parenting. There's always somebody to hand the baby off to, and and the baby knows it's safe all the time because it's just never it's never and the and the caring people around it are part of a family. They're part of a tribe. They're they're they got each other's backs all the time. And I imagine there's a lot more of that down there in Costa Rica. Yeah, I spent some time down there in Uvita and some of the beauty you know and, and uh, a tennis. So anyway, so let's talk about these these missing experiences and specifically like what kind of personality features does it result in if someone is either brought up by parents who are giving them that kind of 
constant warmth, constant physical touch, constant attentiveness or just togetherness um, versus, you know, the way, the way Jean Leadloff describes it is, is like that, you know, the modern culture almost our child rearing is like, you're going, you're, you're, you're having this adversarial relationship with your child where you're trying to force them to be apart from you, to cry it out, to be in a crib alone, you know, to be in a playpen with inanimate objects, to, to be separate from you or to be home, you know, with someone else, babysitter, nanny, whatever, while you're at, off at work, instead of that constant togetherness. What, what, what kind of personality traits or features does that, do those missing experiences result in? Look, look at all the neuro neurotics around you and you'll see the many different forms of adaptations. The individual will ha make an adaptation. It has to, to survive. It's like, okay, I'm not getting what I need. I'm going to, it tweaks itself. And this is all happening very unconsciously. The first two years of life, there's no object constancy. There's the child is just in the soup and it's learned, it's being conditioned to protect itself at some level. So let's take Jean for an example. She's a pretty extreme case. Um, she was born to a mother who never wanted to be, be a mother, an artist. She came out of the womb and, and at the time that she wasn't given to her until a few minutes later, once she was you know, cleaned up and wrapped in swaddling clothes or whatever and handed to her mother. And her mother said, take the disturbance away mm. in Italian. So Jean's thing was that always that we want to feel welcome and worthy. And she felt absolutely the opposite. She felt completely unwelcome. Now that's laid down in her psychology at a very, very deep level. And then there's all kinds of other stories about the mother. You know, it, it, it's all in here, the, the whole, you know, there's no, you really get to know Jean from her first moments to her last breath. So she always had a, uh, we came to call it the blind spot. So when I first met her, we had lunch down at the, I met her in San Francisco at a talk in, in Pacific Heights. I tracked her down once I read the book and she happened to live in my backyard. I was living in San Francisco. She was, I'd ride my bike over to Sausalito once I started assisting her. So um, she, the first time we met at the Depot Cafe, she looked at me and she used to call me darling or pussycat all the time. And she said, pussycat, there's something I do to push people away. I don't know what it is. I lose friendships. Gloria Steinem was a good friend and I must've done it to her because she doesn't return. Just promise me you won't go away. Just tell me what I'm doing. I want to understand what I'm doing. I help all these people. Nobody can seem to help me. How do I push people away? So, you know, this was a theme throughout our relationship and she tried to push me away all the time. It was a meanness like this. It would be like a cat would come out and scratch me, you know, and hiss. And then I'd go like, well, you just did it. And she'd be, oh, don't be an idiot or you're being too sensitive. So when this, so this blind spot we have, I, I think of it, and this is also the, the, the story of this is all in here because Jean, I, I was able to help her see her blind spot at the end of her life. Wow. Only because I had been with really a shaman type who showed me mine through a process that's described in the book. Mm -hmm. So we all develop these, I call it the not self. It's like whatever the, whatever the adaptation, which becomes a strategy to handle stress and overwhelm becomes part of your personality. It's that fish doesn't know that it's in water because it doesn't know anything else. This is who we think we are. And it's really this damaged little thing that has some way of defending itself when it feels threatened. And Jean's was this, Jean's was this tendency to defend herself with this, this, push away behavior is what I called it. So in answer to your question, remind me your question. <laughs> yeah, basically like the personality differences that emerge. Oh, right, genes, okay. Between kids who are parented in these two different ways, modern culture versus, uh, yeah. versus the continuum way. Well, so, you know, think about if you didn't get this experience, you're walking the right experience when you were a child so that your, you know, your immune system and everything is dialed in the way it's supposed to be. Life is comfortable and there's a lot of joy. It doesn't mean there isn't pain. I haven't read anything from the book yet and I want to, but let me finish the thought. So in the absence of the right experience, there's adaptations and all these different neurotic 
formulations of a human being psychology emerge. Some of that's addiction, criminality, normal, Jean wrote this beautiful article called Normal Neurotics Like Us. So we think this is normal. We think this like, you know, underfunctioning, troubled, bored, angry, tired, unfulfilled, uh, seeking happiness. We think that this is normal. We think that this is the human condition. We assume that this is the, you know, this is the, the school that we're in. And yes, it is. And the hope of all this is that with the adaptations, there comes a, a there, there's, a, there's a biological evolutionary need that wants to be met. So that's to be comfortable in your skin. Bottom line, it's like, I'm comfortable in my skin. The world's a safe place. I can feel my joy because that's what I am in my innermost is this light and love and joy. And, but there's all this like cage around it so that it can't be expressed. Right. So, but we, but we don't just crawl up in a corner and say, see, I didn't get what I needed as a child. And it's not my fault that I'm so messed up and I can't do this anyway, or become a criminal. You know, that these are the kinds of options we have in our world. And you can see it all around you. There's as many different adaptations as there are humans walking the planet. Some of them are more severely disturbed than others. Some of them people live with, they numb out, they never notice, they don't care. They think this is life. So the beauty of the book and, and part of why I'm so passionate about it is it actually, if people read it and it's, it's a compelling read, I have to say, um, I've been writing books for over, well, for close to 20 years now for other people, ghostwriting and editing. And this is the first book that, you know, I got to write and what an assignment, you know, to like research this woman's life, go into the jungle in my mind's eye. I didn't travel down there, but, you know, to look at letters that she wrote in the fifties and in the, it, the letter that she wrote that finally led to her uh, book contract and just to dig around in somebody's life like that, you know, in the historical period, it was so much fun, but um, you know, they lived in joyful, good cheer. Like when we develop optimally and when our brains are functioning and our everything, you know, we're not as sickly. We have energy. We have, but let me read you this story. You will love this. Talk about seeing where the roots of energy uh, depletion come from. So there's any number of them I could do, but I particularly love this one. So it's her first expedition. She's with Enrico Middleton, the Italian, the aforementioned blonde haired, blue eyed Italian count. And the financier of this expedition, who's a little fat man named Beppe Orlando. <laughs> and they're, they're three or four days into the trek upriver. To, they're going to the Santa territory. The Santa is a tribe that Enrico was familiar with, not far from where the, the diamonds had been found in the past. And this was before the, you know, the rainforest got overrun with civilization and all the nightmare down there now. But so uh, let's see. Enrico recognized the passage ahead. He had traversed it before, and he began to describe the challenge that lay ahead in detail. We'll have to climb over the steep granite wall next to our Pucci Falls, he said. How steep, Jean asked. Quite, Enrico replied, avoiding her eyes. This is the passage you told me about, Beppe frowned nervously. Yes, Enrico replied. Then with a single slow nod of his head, this is the one. Still avoiding Jean's gaze, he went on. They place logs across the path of the canoe and haul it inch by inch. The sun is merciless. You could get heat stroke. He described the pain he'd experienced time and again when the canoe would slip into a crevice between boulders and pivot out of control, scraping his shins and ankles against the granite. Jean's face remained stoic. Beppe looked horrified. Fearing what lay ahead, the three of them spent several days bracing themselves for the hard work and pain that was sure to follow. They arrived at the waterfall full of dread and primed to suffer, already hating every moment of the portage. They started off grim-faced, dragging the canoe up the rocky slope. When the canoe swung sideways, the sheer weight of it would pin a member of the work party to a burning rock while the others scrambled to move it off. A quarter of the way up, all ankles were bleeding. By way of begging off for a bit, Jean jumped ahead to photograph the scene. She climbed up 10 yards and perched high on a rock. From that vantage point at a distance from the action, she noticed a curious fact. There before her was a group of men engaged in a single shared task. Two of them were tense, frowning, losing their tempers at everything and everyone, cursing in the distinctive way of Tuscan men. The tarpon guides, on the other hand, 
were having a fine time of it. They were laughing at the unwieldy canoe and making a game of the battle with gravity and rock. Between pushes, they shoved off their scrapes. They showed off their scrapes and bruises. When once again, the canoe would wobble forward, pin one, then the other of them underneath it, they responded with amusement rather than upset. The fellow who was held barebacked against the scorching granite invariably laughed the loudest mm. once he could breathe again. <laughs> all of the men were doing the same work. All were experiencing the same strain and pain. All were sweating in the blazing hot sun. There was no difference in their situations except one. Jean and the Italians had been conditioned by their culture to believe that such a combination of circumstances was at the very bottom of the scale of well-being. What's more, they were quite unaware they had a choice, any other option as to how they could experience the situation. The guides were equally unaware of their choice. These supposedly primitive people had also been conditioned to deal with their circumstances in a particular way. They knew what lay ahead, but hadn't spent the days before the trek wallowing in dread, quite the contrary. They approached the portage in a perfectly merry mood. They seemed to revel in the camaraderie. Each forward move of the canoe was viewed as a victory, a cause for celebration. So their whole life, this was another thing from your course that I learned, I mentioned it earlier and didn't go down that particular rabbit hole, but about play. So everything they do is play. You know, I'm, I'm trying more and more. I heard something the other day I was listening to. Uh, her name is Garcia. She's one of the researchers. She wrote a book. I can't think of her last name. Garcia. She wrote a book called uh, The Evolved Nest. That is really drills down her research into what indigenous cultures around the world, hunter gatherer tribes around the world, have, they, they have these common practices common in all cultures in all parts of the world. And this is, so, so the continuum correct parenting practices have been very well articulated by many different scientists. So I'm gonna do a second edition of this that will be bigger and hardback and hopefully published by some big, you know, with a whole research session, looking at what science has now said to verify. Because when she talked about carrying the baby around all the time, that people were horrified you'll spoil the child that will not and how am i going to go to work and all that kind of thing never mind the family bed talk about controversy you know all these stories about children being killed because daddy rolls over well if he's dead drunk maybe but that's not going to happen you know so all very um all very fascinating so back to the play thing i've been trying to i noticed again after i read that we need play as much as we need sleep like it's the second thing we need the most is play. Mm -hmm. And yet when we have these neurotic fi fixations, it's hard for us to get into a playful place. You know, a person first needs to, to A, learn to recognize when their anxiety or something is coming up and connect it to the missing experiences. That in itself takes a couple of weeks of like real observation. People can do it. And then once they learn the signs and the bodily signals that are saying, you're not getting what you need, distress, 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 that's their infant sphere still reacting to that trauma that's laid down deep in the nervous system. And you can't really go down there and unwind the trauma, but you can find a more adaptive way of dealing with stress. So I talk to people about the deep breathing, you know, that vagus nerve is calmed by humming. There's all kinds of things you can do once you to self-soothe that part of you that didn't get what it needed, that's still craving touch and love and acceptance. So you've got to give it to yourself because let's face it, you can't crawl back into the crib and do it right. Yeah. So, um, so, but this need for play, I was reminded the other day. So I'm just looking at how can I work this into my life? Mother's Day was fun. I, I did it in a playful way. You know, I get these really yummy chocolates, like the best ones you can get, dark chocolate, good chocolate, truffles with actually soft centers. Anyway, so I got two of them. I got the one on the top and then I turned it, they're beautiful black boxes with gold embossed, happy Mother's Day. And I got her two of them and put them top to bottom and wrapped them together. And she's like, there are two here. And I said, mom, I said, I gave you one box that you have to share with me. And I know you'd want a box all to yourself. So you got two, you know, and she just <laughs> laughed and gave me this big hug. And it was like, like make things play. I'm trying to teach myself Canva. 
And I'm, you know, I'm not a digital native. I didn't grow up with a phone, the phone in my hand. I remember when we first got uh, answering machines. That's how long I've been around. Mm -hmm. So, so, but so it, it's not natural to me. I struggle with technology, but I decided to make Canva fun. I'm like, okay, just go in there and play. It's like your crayons and just treat it like, you know, you're having a craft day and go in there and play around. Changes the experience entirely. Yeah. So I don't have to schedule play dates. You know, with COVID, it's been hard to go out and do the things I love to do, play Frisbee. I mean, my knees, I can't quite play Frisbee on the beach anymore, but still those playful things to build them into one's life is another way to build, build your energy, you know, really. And then the other thing I'll just, um, do we have a few more minutes? Can I read yeah, you? We have, we have, we have more time and I'll, I'll mention quickly what I did for mother's day yesterday. Oh, I'd love to hear. Uh, I took my wife surfing. She's teaching mm. her how to surf. So she's like maybe eight or 10 sessions into it. Mm. She had her best day of surfing ever. So, oh, that's so, that a what a memory. Day. Yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> and then it, as I mentioned before, we went to a, a dance party. Yeah. That yeah. just sounds so delightful. It was a nice. I was day. hoping your kids would run in or you would bring them in to say hi when you were out. And I saw the dog, but I didn't see the family. <laughs> my son's at school and my daughter's napping. Oh, uh -huh. so how old is she, the little one? She's a year and eight months. Mm. Well, I love seeing the photos of you and your family. They're just beautiful. So I lost my train of thought. What, what was I talking about? I don't remember. I, I have a question for you. Yeah. Um, what, <clears throat> this, is, this is something that happened personally that I'd be curious to get your input on. Um, we have a, a guest house in my property here. And... Um, I, my, my wife had a friend who, um, they're from New York and they have a history of friendship. And so I invited them to stay in our, her and her husband and their two kids, uh, who are the same age as my son, four and a half years old. I invited them to stay in our guest house and, um, pri like partly based on, Hey, like it would be great to have more community it's my wife's friend. She, she has a friend. My son would immediately have friends on the property. Yeah. Um, but there was, there was actually a big problem that I didn't quite foresee, which was those two kids, they're actually twins, um, were, were uh, trying to think of the right words. They, they, there was a constant pestering of my son. They, they yeah. constantly saw themselves in competition with my son. They took every opportunity to um, try to one-up him, try to compete with him, try, it was almost like bullying, but in the form of yeah. like verbal yeah. abuse. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, but like a constant unrelenting supply of verbal abuse and like a total lack of empathy. For example, if my son fell and like injured himself and was bleeding, instead of going over there to console him, they would take the opportunity to like make fun of him. Mm -hmm. uh, or when he was learning, when I was teaching him recently how to ride a bike and these two kids already knew how to ride a bike, they were constantly they rubbing were... into his face that they were better at riding a bike than him. Oh, and, you know, like on my, the first day of him riding a bike, he's got these two kids in his face constantly telling him, I don't need my dad to help me get on my bike, you know? Um, and, and I could give you a hundred more examples. There was also a lot of um, manipulative lying behaviors. For example, they would, like I witnessed it several times things like um, they would say to my son, you're stupid. And my son would say, would say back, no, I'm not stupid. And then they would yell to either their parents or me, Mateo just called me stupid. Oh, so wow. They, they were manipulating him. They were trying oh, to him to get him in trouble. Mm. And the son was sitting there saying, like, he didn't even understand that. What was thing. going on. It's, yeah. Not, yeah. it's not in him at all to do that. So yeah. he didn't even understand yeah. what they were doing. Mm. So he was sitting there trying to explain, no, I didn't call you stupid. I just, oh. I wasn't stupid. You must have misheard me. You know, uh -huh. like he so, doesn't. Well, that's understand. beautiful. Like, he can just explain himself. Yeah, like he doesn't even understand that another kid would lie to intentionally yeah, yeah. get him in trouble in that way. So um, anyway, my 
my, my point is we really raised our son in this continuum way. He was on us 24 seven. He's been given so much love since he was a little kid. Mm -hmm. And I really wonder whether these behaviors that I was observing in them, in these two other kids is, is ties into this. And if a oh. lot of those competitive sort of need for bullying, constant need to one up others and, and need for external validation that you're the best and need to put others down. You know, Gene talks a lot about, you know, it's, it's innate in us cooperation. And yes. what I witnessed in these two kids was not a cooperative vibe. It was in a very much antic, antagonistic, I like agree. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to tear you down to build yep. myself up. Yep. I'm wondering yep. if, if you can comment on that dynamic. A bit. So um, I do want to be careful here because I don't like to do any parent shaming. You know, most parents are doing the best they can and they don't know. They just don't know. So this adversarial relationship between parent and child is kind of set up in a culture that sees children as, I mean, the Aquana, there was no such thing as the terrible twos. You know, there's a certain individuation that comes at two at two years old and the child pushes a bit here and there. But for the Iquana, it was normal. It was expected that this would happen. And they made a joke of it. You know, it's like a little kid goes, hits another little kid with a stick. He's not strong enough to hurt him. So it's like, that's what he's supposed to do. He's a hunter gatherer. And this is a behavior. I worked at a, um, a boys center for a while and these kids would just like wrestle. And then and the, the, we were trained to say no hands on, no hands on. Like, you know, they're mammals, just mammals play. And part of how boys get stronger is they kind of, so this is a maladaptive version of that that's based in deep. So your son has a deep sense of himself. He's secure, he knows who he is. He's not been separated from his, like his natural power to kind of stand up for himself. He doesn't have to do it manipulated. He just goes, he's like confused because nobody's ever done this to him before. But so that's his signal. So when you think about these signals, he's signaling, I'm not getting the right thing. He's not like collapsing around their insults. He's just kind of going with it and like sorting it out for himself and saying, well, this ain't right for me. You're, you're misunderstanding. If he could say, you you misunderstood me, you know, I didn't say that. I can kind of see him. I didn't say that. Like, what are you talking about? You know, rather than, oh, you know, the manipulation didn't work, basically. They didn't get away with it. I want to read you something from the book again. So, so we're talking about children. I can't say what, you know, I wouldn't go so far as to say that the parents Maybe the child saw the dad, you know, some people would attribute it to any number of things. You can't know until you really get into someone, they become interested in finding out, A, they see it as a problem. You know, maybe they have a heart attack when they're older because they're competing so hard in the corporate world or something. And then they have to look at that. Like, what is it that I'm dishonest in my integrity shit? Or I've been drinking for so long that I've got a list of amends to make this long because of the number of people I've squashed with my arrogance, you know, which right. is not natural. Yeah, so, but it, it's, it's, it's exactly that. It's this fundamental, it's this fundamentally adversarial relationship yes, with all yes. the other humans around you you want to be up here you want everybody else to be down here and you you don't have any empathy you don't care that you're putting them down or making them look bad or lying to make them look bad um because you need to be up here right and it's it's that it's that fundamentally adversarial relationship with the world around you that seems just totally at odds with this sort of um innate sort of sense of cooperation that gene describes yeah, there's um, so there's something about the dominance model too. This tracks to Rihanna. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to be articulate enough about this to go too far down that way. But there, so the conditioning exists in the society. You know, in the even in the capitalistic society, there's there's competition built in. So Jean had some interesting observations, and it's this whole adversarial bit. The best example is she used to say. So uh, the parents say to the child that he's, he, they're going out and he's going over to grandma's house for the evening. And mom says, now be good, Johnny. So what she's really saying is you're bad, so fake it. Mm -hmm. So the children, do, the children match mom and dad's expectations. That's also part of their evolutionary heritage. Yeah. They have to look around and see what's done in the tribe and learn to do that if they're gonna survive. And that's modeling. You know, 90% of what we learn, we learn from modeling, mm -hmm. you know, they imprint on us. So there's something about chimpanzees that they do this. It's the alpha, you know, it's like the establishing of the, so that's an instinct. Uh, 
I, I don't know if I can go so far as to say it's a lower instinct, but I imagine it is mm -hmm. because humans, one of, one of the editions of Jean's book was called something like something about, uh, oh, I'd have to look it up. Paradise Lost was one. She didn't care for that one, but there was another way. Allowing human nature to work successfully. Mm -hmm. Human nature working successfully looks like cooperation and building a society that if the nature is working successfully, the, the, the relationship with the natural world, the relationship, the connections with other are working successfully. So everything's like smooth. You're talking about children that were not with that were I won't say children that were raised like wolves, but there are ways of, uh, directing the instinct in a way that isn't optimal. You know, it comes down to that optimization thing. Like, are you gonna do what's up? So, so just cause I know we probably should wrap up after our little blip, but- We're okay on time. Okay. Yeah. I have a, oh, I'm okay till two actually. Yeah. So okay. this is, um, we could do a long form interview. <laughs> this is a, a, when you brought up the boys, um, I just love hearing about your son's reaction, but, but I want to read you this section because it gives you a sense of what might be the continuum correct way for little boys to, to interact, which your son would be far more capable of than. I want to mention one other thing, one other example of what I noticed is um, this, these other kids, they would constantly say things like it's just this unrelenting stream of pestering 24 seven of my son where they would say, I'm, I'm taller than you. And the kid, the kid is actually shorter than my son. And he would say, I'm bigger than you. And he would say, um, I have bigger feet than you. And the kid has actually the same or smaller size feet. And he would say, I'm stronger than you. And I'm better at this than you. I'm better than that th th than you. And, and, um, wow, that's I'm smarter than you and all these things. And my son would constantly say he would respond and he wouldn't say, no, I'm smarter than you. No, I'm stronger than you. No, I'm better than you. He would say, no, we're equal. We're equally strong. We're equally smart. And I never taught him to say that, but that was always his response. He didn't understand what was going on. And he, my, my son wanted to just be everybody's equal. This kid <laughs> needed to constantly put everybody else down so he could be yeah. the best. Yeah. And he wasn't conditioned to the make wrong you know, to the one-up machine. So he wasn't like, now this is another thing that happens in continuum cultures. It's like, he was just offering them a correction. Mm -hmm. You know, so they, Jean used to talk about that with little kids. She'd say, you know, if they do something you don't want them to do, you just show them what you do want them to do. Mm -hmm. It's like, here's the correct way. This is what we do. No charge, assuming the assumption is they want this information. Mm -hmm. They want this information. And she would say, if they don't do what you ask them to do, ignore them. Mm -hmm. They hate to be left out of the action. <laughs> no, like they don't want to be left out. So just right. don't, don't reinforce the bad behavior by giving it attention. Yeah. You know, yeah. just, and, and if they still don't do it and like you're leaving and you got to just sit, just walk over and, you know, very gently, you know, we're going now and carry, take, take them along. It's not like, Wah! you know, we're going, grab them by the arm or, you know, intimidate them into doing what you want. So I'm sure you guys just naturally, because you gave yourselves permission to feel your instincts and follow them early enough on that, that he's had, you know, his sense of self is intact. Yeah. He's not, he hasn't fractured off. So he has this false, false self. He's, con, he's, whole mm -hmm. you know he didn't ha his his psychology didn't get fractured all over the place you know he, he was he he didn't need to do a lot of ad adaptations mm -hmm. he can just be himself you know and he because he knows what he knows so i'm going to read you this part please this was i don't know which trip it was it's on page 118 so probably the second i just love all this stuff it's so much fun <laughs> Okay, so um, she's back in New York and she's reflecting on her experiences. As the unlearning continued, Jean's appetite for new ideas grew. Assumptions that had been closed and treated as facts were blasted open. She no longer accepted the supposedly obvious truth of beliefs such as progress is good and leisure is preferable to work. Also confronted was the American notion that a man's emotions are a sign of weakness that ought to be hidden lest the feeling man lose the esteem of his peers. A boy in the civilized world will be taught this lesson in a myriad of ways long before he approaches manhood, but no such lesson or expectation is foisted upon a Yaquana boy. 
repressing emotions does not become a cornerstone of his identity of a man, as a man. One day, a Yaquana boy of 10 years old came to see her, screaming loud enough for the entire village to hear. Jean knew the boy. She had observed him playing with the other boys for weeks. She thought of him as utterly self-reliant and, like many of his peers, highly disciplined. Through her cloudy, supposedly civilized lens, the boy appeared to be a master of his emotions. She had no behavioral template for what began to unfold before her eyes that day. Here was a 10 year old boy clinging to his mother, making a terrific fuss in front of the whole tribe. He had an abscessed tooth, but made no heroic effort to remain stoic or conceal his emotional reaction to intense physical pain. Nothing in the boy's past experience suggested he would suffer ridicule if other boys saw him in such a shaky state, nor would he lose anyone's esteem for running to mommy for comfort. Quite the contrary everyone completely understood. The other boys readily accepted his sudden withdrawal from their fearless ranks. A cluster of children, many of whom were the boys' playmates, hovered around while Jean extracted the tooth. They gave off none of the subtle signals modern boys would use to mock or shame the lad. His mother remained close, not overly concerned, just quietly available, while Jean began the procedure. He blanched at the pain, she had no Novocaine, and let out a shrill wail when she finally worked the tooth free. She plugged the bleeding hole with gauze. It was over. Exhausted, the boy went straight to his hammock, not even turning to look at his mother. He felt no need to assess the reaction of his peers. An hour later, he approached Jean's hut. The color had returned to his cheeks. He said not a word, just played with some of the rocks nearby as if to let her know he was okay. Then he wandered off to rejoin the other boys. I love that. Very relevant also to what I was describing. Yeah. 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 I mean, competition is built into our society. I mean, the competition between women, oh my God, you don't even want to hear about that. Just some crazy stuff. I do want to read one other favorite part. This kind of zooms out and gives a bit of a context for how we are, tracks back to your, your, your question about, uh, the neuro, you know, our discussion about the neurosis and all that. So yeah, okay. So this is a chapter called The Concrete Jungle. So she's back in New York now. She'd seen an undeniable truth. The Yaquana as a people were happy, their lives filled with joy. They were free in ways outsiders could not even conceive. She hardly noticed this until, back in New York, she looked around and saw the throngs of malcontents. The difference in terms of general disposition itself expressed itself quite noticeably in their physiologies. The Yaquana were smaller and less muscular, and yet they could carry heavier loads far greater distances than the strongest civilized man. While in the jungle, Jean did not wonder why that was so. Not until she returned to the States did she notice the contrast between the relaxed physiology of the Aquana and the tense armored bodies of New Yorkers. Years later, once she had time to fully understand the implications of what she'd seen, she would explain it this way. That much tension would make anyone weak. The indigenous people I lived with were relaxed and at ease pretty much all the time. They don't waste their natural energy worrying about what might happen. They don't resist or refuse to accept what is happening in the moment. Rather than waste their natural vitality fighting a fight that can't be won, they have plenty of energy available for strenuous activities. Upon returning to the US, Jean was astonished to see the fierce looks on the faces of people on the streets of Manhattan. I came upon a number of scenes, she says, on the subway or in Grand Central Station and almost daily in Times Square that were more savage than anything I'd seen among the jungle people. Of particular interest to her was the contrast between the faces of the Yaquana and the faces of New Yorkers. The jungle people were transparent. Their feelings showed on their faces. They had no reason to conceal, censor, or revise what they were feeling in order to fit in or conform to social norms. They simply felt what they felt. When their faces weren't reflecting some emotion, they were in repose. Jean had never seen a New Yorker's face in repose. 
The faces of the people she saw all around her were seldom clear. Having lived among the unguarded Yaquana for a total of nearly two years, she couldn't help but notice that the faces of New Yorkers reflected an inner battle, a fixed look of anger, a fixed smile, broadcasting the fear it was meant to conceal, a stone cold walled off look of discontent or disdain. Moreover, people often planted seeds of distrust when the words that came out of their mouths didn't match their obvious emotional state. People consistently scrambled their communication, creating a toxic environment of wariness and suspicion. In, contra in contrast, a Yaquana's face was like the sky, host to various weather patterns, but otherwise clear and sunny. They displayed a total lack of emotional complication, but not because their feelings weren't complex and varied. Their faces revealed an extraordinarily wide range of emotional states, but their baseline was joy. They had no need to pursue happiness because happiness pervaded everything they experienced, even grief, sickness, and death. Among their fellow tribesmen and women, they had no need to hide or alter their feelings. The atmosphere around and between them was one of deep trust and respect. This stark difference led Jean to draw a new distinction it seemed to her that real feelings occur in the moment and when fully felt are a complete experience with no residual emotion to carry forward and color the future. In contrast, feelings that are not fully felt turn into blocked energy that leave the experience incomplete. Jean had never seen the Yaquana complicate their feelings by denying them. Feelings were not repressed or disallowed. The Yaquana did not hold onto unresolved feelings, become overly emotional, and then act out in, in a display of bad behavior, a common occurrence among New Yorkers. There's just a tiny bit more that finishes that up. People call New York a concrete jungle, but they have never been to the jungle, she would reflect. It may sound a bit cliche, but I actually lived in a real jungle, and I can tell you, we are the savages. What is natural to our species is the norm in the jungle. In New York, what is natural is far from the norm. More shocking, what is natural isn't even known. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. Um, it's made me think of the whole concept of, of the persona that, that we learn about in psychology, yeah. um, which is the, fundamentally the mask we put on to interact with the world to interact with other people yeah. um, that allows us to be the way that they expect us to be or that we want to display to them. And the more there is this mismatch between what our natural tendencies, our innate tendencies or needs are, and what society expects of us, the more there is this need to, to create this thick persona. And it's funny, I, I, you know, since I was a little kid, I remember really loving dogs because of the complete absence of a persona. I remember just appreciating this from the time I was a little kid that when you interacted with a dog, what you saw was their true nature and exactly whatever they were feeling and experiencing is exactly what was displayed outwardly. And I always remembered from the time I was a kid being really annoyed at humans that we weren't that way. <laughs> and I'm like, why are people not the same way? Why, why do people become all of this, this, you know, create all these layers of inauthenticity that get in the way of them expressing themselves authentically. It drove me crazy. My whole life still does today. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think the other thing that, that jumps into my head, which I think maybe is not obvious to everybody listening, but I would love for you to tie this into the concept of energy. Like how oh, that's, that's what I was just that's what I'm thinking, what I've been. So what you're describing is the norm that, you know, normal neurotics like us, everybody has this mask. If you meet someone who doesn't, it's startling mm -hmm. or whose light shines through it enough that, that you're not distracted by it and you can see who they are. And that's a lot of what I think all the spiritual developmental personal growth stuff is people kind of know there's something missing. They know they're being fake. How many people have the, uh, you know, I'm a poser thing going on and Instagram encourages it, you know, so people have more and more uh, uh, energy holding up the falseness or the image. You know how much energy that takes 
Yeah, it's like it's like psychological energy, like what an energy drain trying to be something you're not trying to, peep to you know, you got to try and track what everybody expects of you. That takes a lot of energy. That's a lot of brain power. And we know that the brain burns most of our energy anyway. And yours is going over time to figure out how to be to get the acceptance you didn't get when you were an infant. That's exactly right. So, you know, we're kind of we're in a bad situation here. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of remedies. And, you know, maybe we can talk about that in another in another session, because there's there. I don't want to leave people with a sense of hopelessness about this. If anything, I want to leave them with a sense of hope, like as, like just reading this book resurrected my my instinctive intelligence. You know, I started teaching something called primal movement for a while which was not unlike the, the continuum work. Interestingly enough, there's that movement, movement work called continuum, which is not the same way Gene uses the, well, there's a little similarity actually, but there's, uh, there is so much we can do to get back in touch with our instinctive intelligence to begin to trust it. So many of us were taught not to trust it. Like, put your jacket on, I'm not cold, but put your jacket on. Like, oh, I can't trust my own body temperature, you know? I can't trust, and we're too little to be able to make sense of that. The or first I can't trust time. my own immune system. So it, it becomes this, like, there's, exactly. It's like, wow, having a fever is a horrible, awful thing. Well, if, you know, what if that's what the body needs to do to get well? Right. We treat everything, we treat symptoms because we don't look at the causes or trust the body to do what it wants to do. Don't get me going on that one. Yeah. But the, um, to Wait. your question, so much of the way we live is an energy drain. You know, that's why your work is so valuable for the people who find you because there are, you know, mind body hacks that can help. And I, my hope is that this book would give people a, a shift in mindset or, Really, people don't change because they need to change. People change because they become inspired. Mm -hmm. And even for me to develop, you know, being playful about the things that used to be hard, you know, that's like, that's a total flip. I mean, I lose things all the time I, I, and I'm not alone. I read a study that said something like the average person says spends 40 minutes a day looking for misplaced objects, you know? <laughs> so now I make it into a game. It's like, okay, here's an opportunity to play. It's hiding somewhere, you know? <laughs> Did you see where my glasses landed? I can't find my backpack, but I know it's hiding in here, you know? <laughs> it's up to something. So it, there's a way to like build play into life. And that alone would start to start to shift a person's biochemistry and neural networks to be able to see the world differently and to see love and joy and opportunities for kindness, you know, to, to practice gratitude, all of those things that all the, you know, personal development systems talk about, you know, they're rooted in that stuff. I love the work of Brene Brown and her book that has the 10 pillars of wholehearted living. Like, wow, between that and Jordan Peterson's 12 rules for life. And he has another book out now, like that's some sage advice coming from those two. Yeah. Like, if people had the, if this book or your work or whatever they, they find to give them that first boost of energy, because you can't really get up out of the quicksand yourself. You know, you can try as you like, but unless you relax and let somebody who, who's not in the quicksand pull you out gently with whatever it is, and you trust that universe is gonna give you what you need to, to walk on this world as yourself in your skin, not wasting all that energy on posing, like let's call it what it is. Instagram is like poser central. Mm -hmm. It's pretty sad. But when somebody shows up and they're authentic, that sends like, a, that's like a note through the whole, like this is possible. There's somebody who's being themselves. Wow, maybe I want to take their course or whatever it is because it can spread. Yeah, you know, It has its own because people recognize it. And when that chord is struck, Rumi used to say, the one clear note at the center solves everything or something like that. I used to recite a lot of Rumi. I'll have to look that one up because it is that way. Like there's a clear note. And if somebody strikes it, there's the, that resonance, you know, that tuning fork effect. So the more people that reconnect with their essential nature there and, and the more primal protectors like us who walk around the world going, wait a minute, something primal going on there. You don't want to mess with it. It's actually more intelligent than your, your civilized ideas about how to do things. Yeah. So anyway, so it's, 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 if I could try to summarize this briefly, like the central concept, it's basically like, if there is this mismatch between our needs, our innate needs from the time we're newborns, 
yeah. and what inputs we're receiving from our parents, from the world around us, it creates fractures in our, in our psychology and our personality and creates all of the, it creates this, this tension creates the persona. It creates all of this, um, energy that's being spread spread out and a kind of loss of parts of the self mm -hmm. that then in order to regain you have to go on this search for um kind of wholeness again mm -hmm. is that is that accurate or how would you phrase it uh well we can't go back to the continuum but you know there's that what is it the japanese art of imperfection you know where you put the gold in in the broken vase and then it's a different kind of beautiful mm -hmm. it's like we can't just give up we have to find our way home as best we can and start treating each other as humans there's something so beautiful about the possibility of recognizing these things you know i, I mean really all of civilization moved emerged from this cracked you know vase with a, like this is so far from the continuum, but here we are. We can't go back. You know, I, I have this feeling that there is a, there's a movement. I can see it. There's, you know, there's all these eco villages. There's in somewhere in Denver, there's some guy who's building this um, housing, not, housing development or something, but it's kind of a high rise and it's made out of the, the big containers, you know, the ocean going containers and they're making houses out of it. And I, like, I'm visualizing it. He didn't say this, my brain did. Like this is like a hive, like everybody's gonna have their little cells. And th there's a way that you, the, the, we know the nuclear family doesn't actually work. So people have to come together using what we got. Mm -hmm. Technology isn't going anywhere, but how can we use it in a way that it actually uh, brings human nature, our deeper nature forward instead of putting our, our, our darker angels on the front burner? You know, that there's a way that our better angels can we can elicit it in each other there's you know there's the smart city and there's a there's I, I know this cluster of brilliant geeks who are wanting to create i'll just call it a kind city so they have got away you know how in china they have these surveillance and if somebody does something that's out of line all of a sudden everybody shuns them like that's the deepest threat talk about threatening somebody with death you know being shunned by the tribe is sure death and it's really uncomfortable for a long time mm -hmm. until the death comes, you know, like talk about deprivation. You're deprived of the most essential thing for human beings, which is connection, because we all know we can't do it on our own. Lone wolf syndrome be damned, you know, we need each other. We need each other. That's one of the biggest messages is like, let yourself need other people. It's okay, you know, yeah. so, um, I lost your question again, and uh, but I can go on and on about this for a long time. I guess so. If you were, if you were gonna, point, if you were going to kind of summarize maybe the the single biggest takeaway from Jean's work of what we need more of in the world, what would you say? Well, I would say the the most important thing is to to recognize and reinstate wherever possible the correct to make the corrections where we can. You know, we can't change the world, but you never know what's gonna be the trim tab. And it could be that the next generation is the trim tab, particularly if they're in full possession of their innate intelligence, which leads to cognitive intelligence, emotional intelligence, relational intelligence, social intelligence. So, and we do our best in the meantime to notice what a mess we've made. And, you know, I think there's gonna be new society, new, a new society, you know, everything rises up out of the ashes, every empire crashes, and then something new emerges, that's the next evolution of that. So I, I trust that I, I can't live without that optimism. Yeah. But I would say like spreading the word, that's why I wrote this book is to get it. I mean, her book has sold millions of copies, 21 languages. People these days, I mean, some people read her book cover to cover in a sitting, other people find it difficult to read, because she's and intellect, she writes paragraph long, I mean, par yeah, paragraph long sentences. For a lot of people, it's not an easy read. This reads like a good novel, you know, it's an adventure story. So the, 
the the Y and Z generations will pick it up and just like not be able to put it down. Hopefully they'll talk to their friends. Everybody will want a copy. And it's not about, you know, I want to be a national a New York Times bestselling author. I do between you and me, but the story deserves it. And the information in it, the, the transfer of ancient knowledge, the, the permission giving to the, in, the feminine instinct every woman has in her bones. Like, what do we need more right now is for women to really know the truth of who they are and and, and be able to stand in that knowing, then, then the Me Too movement ends, you know, it, it ends because it, the problems resolve because women are in possession of what they know and they can say, no, like this ain't right. Like your son, like, no, that ain't right. You know, not even, not, not even that much energy on it. Just no, this is how we do it. You know, like, it's like, we can all help each other in that way. If we, if we get a passion for it. And my hope is that this book ignites that passion in enough people that the word spreads and that the next generation can be a generation of geniuses that can solve all these problems. You know, they can put technology, there, there's a rumor that there's an algorithm that, uh, that it reinforces the behavior of kindness instead of the behavior of fear and greed. Like what if there was a Google that did that, you know, uh, that, that, that it's all about spreading the love. I mean, these kids could be the ones to really turn it around. Your son, your daughter, you know, they, it's not going to be long before they grow up. And I don't think the climate's going to collapse in the next 20 years. So he'll be, you know, he'll see a solution that if they're in full possession of their intelligence and they're not disturbed by all these neuroses, think how much energy they're going to have to rebuild the world. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I love it. Gerilyn, thank you so much. This has been really a pleasure. Thank you for the work you're doing. I think it's so important. On a personal note, thank you for introducing me to this book. Yeah. Jean's yeah. work several years yeah. ago when I was having kids, when my son was coming into the world. Um, I think the work you're doing is vital. I think it's critical. I know that you're looking for support right now. Uh, just please tell my audience <laughs> what you're looking for. Um, I'm personally going to be making a donation to you to help this work. Um, and I hope that our listeners can, if they feel inspired by this, if they feel um, that it's important to get this message out to the world, I hope that you'll, that speaking to the listeners, I hope you guys will, will help fund uh, Gerilyn to, to get this work out there in a big way. But Gerilyn, tell people where they can go to support you. Yeah, so uh, the website is just junglegene.com. If you go there, you can, you'll get an opportunity to give your email address and then you'll be in the loop to know when the book comes out. It's scheduled June 26. Buy it that day. The, the ebook will be like $1.99 or something so that we can get Amazon bestseller status. That's always a good marketing thing. Mm -hmm. And then there is an Indiegogo campaign. It's another 14 days, I believe from today, which is May 10th. Mm -hmm. um, if we make the goal, we're a third of the way there now. If we make the goal, it will be up forever after. Indiegogo gives you that option. It's called In Demand. So there's a lot of expense involved. I'm hoping to do a podcast myself. You know, I mean, marketing, writing a book is one thing. The promotion of it is a whole nother thing. And I want to get this book out to the world. So the Indiegogo campaign is currently active. Uh, you can go to jun on junglegene.com. Oh no, you just do junglegene.com backslash fund and you'll get a white page that takes you to the Indiegogo campaign. Oh, and when you sign up for your email on the website on junglegene.com, <clears throat> you'll get an audio, a mini audio book of me reading chapter one. So that'll be fun. You'll enjoy yeah. listening to that. And if, if they go to junglegene.com, will you send an email out like yes. to the yep. Indiegogo campaign? So they uh, sure I will watch for um, something that would be helpful with that is, you know, I'll have my guys on the back end figure that out. That's okay. easy then, to do. And then, and then the Indiegogo, Indiegogo campaign is located where? How do they look? That it's, up? If you just go to Indiegogo, I'm pretty sure you can go. If I go from an incognito window, I'll find out. But I think you can just go to Indiegogo and search Jungle Gene. OK. And it will show up. It's, it's there, uh, we'll be live for another two weeks and hopefully beyond that. Okay, um, but, I will try to get this update. podcast out as uh, soon as possible this coming Saturday. That way we okay. can have time to hopefully get as much support for your Indiegogo campaign as possible. Uh, for everybody listening, I have zero financial connection to this. 
Uh, I don't make any money from your donations. This is purely about you supporting Gerilyn's work with, with Jungle Gene and getting this continuum concept information out there to the world. Um, and again, I'm going to be personally donating to this. I hope you all will as well. I think it's incredibly important information that the world, the next generation of children needs to hear. So Gerilyn, thank you so much. I really thank appreciate you, Ari. it. Yeah, it's really and, a delight. Uh, this, this was a pleasure. I hope we can have more conversations in the future as well. I would love that. Beautiful. Okay, bye, bye. Bye. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next